Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. Today I'm bringing to you Dr. Trent Stellingworth from Canadian Sport Institute Pacific. He's got a very interesting background. Uh, he's been involved in applied research plus translational. So he's, a, he's coached Olympic athletes. Indeed, his wife's an Olympic athlete. He was previously head of research and development with Power Bar in Switzerland. He's lived in four different countries. Um, today we focus on REDS, which is relative energy deficiency in sport. It's a relatively new concept to me. As you'll see, I learned along the way. Trent is an expert on this. and Indeed, he was just involved with an IOC meeting to come up with a consensus statement on REDS. As you'll see, REDS doesn't just affect exercise performance, but it also has a lot of health impacts. So uh, affects bone, affects reproductive function. It can cause stress fractures. And indeed, as we discussed, there can be uh, overlap with overtraining. We also discussed the effects of pregnancy on exercise performance. So that was interesting as well. We had a great chat. Um, I learned a lot. I think you'll get a lot out of this one. Now, I do have to say, though, unfortunately, that there was a problem with my audio during this podcast and also the previous one with Nick Tiller. But as you can see, I've got a nice new microphone. So I think things will be better from now on. Hi, Trent. How are you? Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Glenn. It's nice to be here and joining you this afternoon. Yeah. So you're in Canada, right? Uh, Victoria. So on the far west near Seattle. As far west as you can get uh, on an island, Vancouver Island. So it's near Vancouver, the city, but we're uh, Victoria. It's the capital of British Columbia. And we're, uh, yeah, we're like a 90 minute ferry ride from Vancouver or about a two hour ferry ride from Seattle. It looks, it looks really nice around there I haven't, I haven't been i've been to seattle but i haven't been anywhere else hey you've got a really interesting background and like complicated i had to look at your cv and it's like almost got a headache after a page so can you just explain you know you've done all sorts of things you've been involved with olympic athletes you're obviously a scientist you're at um was it university of british no university of victoria cross country and track coach can you give me a bit of a background you know how did you get into all this you know a bit of a summary of your what you do yeah, I'll try to do that uh, pretty quickly. I was a uh, athlete first and foremost that just uh, was interested and excelled in the sciences. And so uh, my wife and I have lived um, in four different countries over the years and kind of moved around and had different roles and different responsibilities. But everything comes back to me probably to elements of human performance and whether that's coaching or whether that's through science pursuits or um, relationships or whatever, it, it, it kind of comes back to human performance. So I'm, I'm Canadian and I went to the U.S. to Cornell University, uh, NCAA track and field scholarship. I was a middle distance runner and I majored in nutrition there and minored in exercise science. I got the research bug and I went back up to Canada to the University of Guelph. And while there, um, I did a master's and PhD with Lawrence Spreet. And oh. Professor Lawrence Spreet is um, I mean, he was the master of ceremonies at my wife and I's wedding. He's still a mentor to me. He means a lot to me. I just retired officially this past year and we had a nice celebration dinner for him at ACSM this year. And Lawrence, uh, spans the breadth between really practical performance, kind of caffeine research all the way to just really good, well done human skeletal muscle metabolism. And so I had a wonderful opportunity to really learn metabolism and physiology, uh, human metabolism and physiology from, from Lawrence. Uh, I then did a postdoc with Luc Van Loon in Maastricht University in the Netherlands. So my wife and I got married and we, we moved uh, overseas. Uh, she's an international level uh, middle distance runner. And so moving to Europe was a great career choice for her too, as the sport of uh, athletics is, is, is quite large there. And then while they're pursuing uh, an academic stream kind of research uh, with, with Luke's lab, an opportunity to be the research and development lead for Power Bar came up at the Nestle Research Center in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, I didn't have the credentials to apply for that job. So for those young um, practitioners and young academics, um, it, it's no harm to apply. And I got an interview and lo and behold, it was able to land that position. And my wife and I then moved to Lausanne and lived there for almost six years. And I worked in industry. Um, but a lot of what we did in industry was, again, performance related through sports nutrition um, via Power Bar. And we sponsored research 
we did research in house that I helped direct, but also sponsored research. So the Louise Burks of the world and John Hawley, and we did some work with Asker Uke and Droop. And um, what a fruitful, rich time for me to develop skills, um, not only in science, but as a project manager, um, skills in business, skills in marketing and commercialization of products. Um, but we knew, and my wife and I knew eventually we wanted to get back to Canada. And uh, in 2011, there was a senior physiology position uh, at the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific here in Victoria, where I, I, where I still am. And it was to come across and lead Rowing Canada's physiology um, program. Okay. Um, I knew nothing about rowing, but I, f I knew a lot about middle distance physiology, given my wife was an international runner, given I coached in that space, um, given my knowledge of muscle metabolism and physiology. Um, I did all my coaching degrees, albeit in track and field. Uh, so we, so yeah, so we moved back here and, and we've been here ever since. I've kind of raised through the ranks. I'm, I'm now the director of research and development for our institute and adjunct at the University of Victoria and at University of British Columbia. So that's it. There's a lot of tangents, a lot of pathways, met a lot of people, four different countries, lots of different experiences. Um, and I'm sure I'm not over. Uh, there's probably going to be twists and turns um, as my career develops from here. That's a lot of stuff. And I heard you, I heard you say your wife, you told me earlier, your wife was a 1500 meter runner yet. And you, you've been to Melbourne because she, she went to the Commonwealth Games, is that right? And you were a middle distance runner. Yes, I was a middle distance runner uh, of a much lower pedigree than my wife ever was. Um, I ran 152 and 800 meters. So it's not that bad, uh, but it's not, not close to world class. Yeah. Um, my wife, uh, Hillary, her first major international games team for Team Canada was the 2006 Melbourne Commonwealth Games. Yep. And uh, she was on the team and I was just an up and coming sports scientist practitioner. And I actually made a pitch to Athletics Canada. I said, I will pay my way there. Yeah. I will find accommodations. I actually stayed uh, with uh, part-time with Matt Watt. Uh -huh. Matt Watt's a great physiologist and muscle metabolism and, and diabetes, oh, you know, Matt. Hormone sense of the lipase and all that, mm -hmm. uh, and Georgie Clark in in Melbourne, and um, I said, if you get me an accreditation, and I'll I'll work with your marathon and race walk team because they didn't have an endurance physiologist then, and and Athletics Canada was like, huh, this this guy's not going to cost us anything other than an accreditation. Yeah. So um, I kind of got my foot in the door that way, and mm -hmm. uh, we have really really amazing and fond memories of Melbourne. Um, Hillary made the final, um, I think she was 10th or 8th overall, something like that. Uh, it was in March, so I turned 30 there. We had a great birthday party for me. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, you know, it, was, it was a I, great I event. Can't, I yeah. can't help being reminded of those Commonwealth Games in 1500, because I remember in the men's, we had the great, the great Hope Craig Mottram, and he got tripped up. He fell down in the 1500. He got tripped up by a Canadian. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> Kevin Sullivan was in that race, and I think they tangled legs a little bit, and he went down. Now, oh. Craig's better event was the 5,000, and oh. to this day, oh. watching the 5,000, yeah, I was too, that watching that 5,000, oh. Craig, Craig took the lead with a mile to go, and absolutely, uh, he only got out kicked by, if I remember right, it's Augustine Chahogi. Um, absolutely. It's still the Commonwealth Games record. Uh, 12.57, I think, is what Chahogi ran that day to be to be I just, I, I just got to shiver up my spine. I've still got it because I was there as well. That when 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 he took the lead in the back straight, they were calling him the Great White Hope because you know yeah. it was all these Kenyans and Tanzanians and whatever took the lead. They called, oh. Anyway, the Ooh. the Melbourne Cricket Ground. I listen. I've been really lucky. I've seen all of Usain Bolt's world records. Been to world championships. Been to multiple Olympics. When he took that lead, I think it's the loudest stadium I've ever been in. in oh, my gosh. Yeah. And guess what? This goes full circle. You're talking about being at amazing events. I was at in, in Vienna when Kipchoge ran 159. Oh, and wonderful. guess who his main, one of his main paces was? And I got to meet him later, Augustine Chogi. Yes. Yep. I think I might have the name quite, not quite right, but the guy that, that beat him that day in 2006, and now he's like 40 or something. But apparently yeah. he's... He's he's um Kipchoge's best mate. 
So he was. They are friends, him. correct? Yeah, they're they both they're not in Etienne. They train down in Eldoret, and uh, yeah. uh, Chahogi is still um, a pace and a rabbit and a pacemaker, um, and still. In, I uh, told him. I said, "You broke our hearts," you know, because I saw him in the hotel and uh, broke out. I wasn't involved with it. I was just hanging out in like a groupie. I said, "You broke our hearts, man." Anyway, yeah. let's let's talk about. So that's really interesting background. Um, there's a lot of people you mentioned there that people will know, even I mean, um, Lawrence Spreet, I'm happy to say, is, you know, despite retiring, he said he'd come on the podcast. And he also wrote a chapter for my exercise metabolism book, which just came yes. out. Yeah. Good man, as you know. Um, all right. So what we're going to do today is talk about, um, you know, the, the REDS. Yeah. So we'll, we'll explain what that is. We'll get you to explain what that is. So relative energy deficiency in sports and, and around that area and how, um, you know, body composition interacts with that and you know, all sorts of things around that. So why don't we just start off, if you can just explain, well, even just like low energy availability compared to REDS all around that sort of area, what we're talking about there, if that's okay. Yeah, so I don't even know if we talked about this prior, but ironically enough, I've just gotten back last weekend from an entire, uh, uh, entire four days to Switzerland and back as last week, the International Olympic Committee um, brought 12 of us together to work on a brand new relative energy deficiency in sport REDS consensus meeting and consensus statement. Yeah. And so what will be involved with that is um, uh, in the middle of next year, the British Journal of Sports Medicine will publish uh, eight to 10 papers on REDS of which the main paper will be an entire consensus paper but there will also be a brand new um, updated, semi-validated uh, clinical assessment tool. And I know we're going to get to assessment in a second. So this topic is near and dear to my heart and, and top of mind, given um, I was just in Lausanne at the IOC and, and we, just, we just talked about it. So as you've said, um, and I can probably articulate um, some of the slight shifts in nuance in terms of what REDS is or isn't or what LEA is or isn't. So um, yeah, the underlying cause of REDS or underlying etiology of REDS is low energy availability. And the equation is very simple. Um, it's energy intake minus exercise energy expenditure corrected for fat-free mass. And what's therefore, whatever energy is then available or left over, because again, it's just energy intake minus the exercise training competition portion, whatever's left over is what your body has for normal functioning or dysfunction, for recovery, for growth, for reproduction. Yeah. And so it's an elegant equation because it gets rid of basal metabolic rate. It gets rid of neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It gets uh, rid of the thermic effect of food, all of which are pretty challenging to measure. Fair enough, Ex energy intake and exercise energy expenditure are also very challenging to measure, to measure uh, accurately. Um, but, but that's the concept of, of low energy availability. Now, REDS is the long-term or severe problematic low energy availability okay. that results in an accumulation of deleterious health and performance outcomes. So things like compromised um, bone marker turnovers, increased stress fractures, increased uh, injuries, uh, attenuation of training adaptation, um, low sex hormones, um, like okay. testosterone's and the, on the banned substance list for a reason. Well, if you're a male and you're, you're in low energy availability, your testosterone just, just tanks. And so it's an accumulation of these deleterious health and performance outcomes. And one of the key uh, kind of nuanced changes that'll come out in the new consensus statement is this idea of problematic low energy availability versus adaptable low energy availability. Um, and, and that has to do with the fact that as humans, we've evolved um, to handle low energy availability through famines. Feast uh, and famine. Yeah, yeah. yeah feast and famine. Um, we want to put people in low energy availability if they're overweight. Yes. Is that problematic? No, it's, it, it's not problematic. Every single night when you sleep for seven, eight, nine hours, the first thing when you wake up in the morning, you're actually in low energy availability. Yes, and right. so, you know, one of my great mentors, Luis Burke, uh, 
her analogy was, it's like alcohol. A sip of alcohol on its own isn't problematic. The continued use of alcohol or increased frequency or too big of a dose, that's what then results in deleterious um, health, uh, health risk outcomes. Okay. And so, can, so I just, can I just- Yeah, sort of go say ahead, jump in there. There's yeah. a bit of stuff there. And I have to say, it's, it's, it's new to me, this, this concept. I, I kept seeing it coming up since I started the podcast, to, to be honest, and I was like, what is this REDS? I actually thought yeah. it was red S. You told me it's not. Red, so I'm yeah. just I'm I'm open to. In some ways, it's good because I can walk through the audience. I guess. So if we just start some low energy availability, okay. So that makes sense. And then if it's chronic, then it's it, then it, then we're talking about relative energy deficit deficiency in sport. Okay. So you're saying you have the energy intake, and then you're subtracting off how much you've actually used during the exercise. Is that what you're saying? So that you're not worrying about the metabolic rate, whatever. Okay, and then and then you sort of jump. So then you're saying, where do you say, oh, it's low? So you know, how do you yep. get to that point where you say, well, it's actually low? Um, yeah, great, great question. So, and, and to further clarify, um, low energy availability is not energy balance. That, that's a different equation. Um, and so through very strictly controlled laboratory studies, um, usually very small cohort over uh, sometimes sedentary individuals, mainly females, and over just five to seven days, there has been some thresholds made for what and when low energy availability becomes low or too low. And Ann Laups uh, did a lot of this research now 20 to 30 years ago. Oh. And the threshold does appear, um, it depends who you talk to, is around 40 kilocalories, 40 calories um, per day divided by kilograms of fat-free mass and in females. And so once you drop below that, you start to go into a, a potentially a higher risk space between 30 and, and 40 kilocalories. Once you get below 30 for females, okay. you definitely can start to measure uh, some of the hormonal uh, dysfunctions that occur. So in females, that's going to be um, elements of estrogen, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, lack of ovulation, uh, T3, thyroid okay. hormones will drop as well. And you can measure in extreme cases within five days, a significant drop in resting metabolic rate, RMR measurements, which of course is reflective of basal metabolic rate. And so- okay. We, we know that those thresholds are there in strictly controlled laboratory conditions. We all hypothesize, and there's some indirect data to suggest men actually have lower thresholds. Uh, women seem to be more sensitive to low energy availability, uh, men less sensitive to it. Um, however, um, some of that work needs to go back and be redone. It needs to be redone in athletes. It needs to be redone in larger cohorts. And in, and in fact, I would say that for the vast majority of registered dietitians or clinicians in the field or exercise physiologists, it is impressively difficult in the field to try to measure accurately an athlete's energy availability. Yeah. Um, so it, I guess, I guess that's tough. just what I'm, I'm trying to, I'm still trying to get my head around. And then we'll talk about in the males and females and all the different. So sorry if I'm a bit slow on this. So it's the energy intake. So if you're saying it's, if it's, you know, below 40, whatever, uh, but then it's how much they actually expended during their official sort of exercise, right? Yep. But, but that must be hard to, to measure as well. So, so when you say, oh, 40s, you know, might be a cutoff, but then it obviously makes a difference if you're, if you're exercising an hour a day versus, six hours a day, then that, you know, you're changing two ends of the spectrum. So then that 40 would be just ridiculously low if you're a Tour de France cyclist, right? Because you're doing so much expenditure, right? So I or, just or you need to try. Yeah, um, or you need to try to eat five to 6,000 calories a day then. Exactly. So I'm just wondering how you actually calculate it. So you go, okay, 40 is the level that you don't want to go below or whatever, but that, that would make a difference, obviously, if you're doing just, half an hour to an hour of really intense exercise a day versus whatever. So I guess I'm just trying to work out how you calculate it. So, so just say if I was doing it for me, yeah? So I ride an hour a day and I also do my 10,000 steps. 
but you wouldn't count the 10,000 steps or like how do you, how do you keep so that? Concurrently with the new uh, IOC REDS consensus statement, one of the papers that's going to be published in association with this, led by Louise Burke, is going to be a methodological best practice yep. on measuring energy availability. And I say that because when does exercise become exercise versus not exercise? So if you're a rower and you're an Olympic rower rowing 30 hours a week on the water, does your bike commute count towards or not? And it, it's not consistent. And if you read study to study, it's not consistent. Some people would call that neat or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is activities of daily living. But if, if you have a 20 minute commute on your bike, that that's exercise. So we need to, especially if, especially if you're running light. Yeah, totally. And you're, you're going hard. And so, you know, maybe it's something like a met score of five, everything under five is counted is not counted and everything over five because all the met and compendium exercise tables exist. And we can, we can lean on that. Another piece that um, is inconsistently applied um, as you will not, uh, it is whether or not on the exercise uh, energy expenditure, you subtract out estimates of basal metabolic rate or not. And when you're exercising for 20 minutes, it doesn't matter. But if you're exercising for six hours a day, if you subtract basal metabolic rate from that, which you're supposed to do, it, it, it makes a big difference. And so I don't want to get too far into the weeds and the nuance of the calculations, but they matter. And it also compounds, um, obviously, uh, with, with measurement error, because even the very best, um, unless it's food weighed in a controlled clinician, in a controlled environment, you can get three to 400 easy uh, calories per day um, over or under reporting on energy intake, easy. And even all the wrist-mounted accelerometry in the world, if you if you compare it to double labeled water, you can have three to four hundred calories per day mismatch on exercise energy expenditure um, estimates. And none of us can accurately measure energy intake or exercise uh, non-evasively with to within three hundred calories. Yeah. That, that's actually a small amount. That's like a big muffin. But if you multiply 300 calories by the entire year and the athlete's actually under fueling oh, yeah. by 300 calories a day, that's like 100,000 calories that they're out. Yeah. And that's the essence of the issue is these small little mismatches day in and day out really add up to a lot of calories, but we don't have tools sensitive enough to measure the small little mismatches. Yeah, I mean, because when you think about, um, I've, I'm used to remember the numbers, but on average, I think across the population, people were putting on, I don't know, three kilograms a decade or something, you know, on average. Yeah. When you work that out, there's something like, you know, four or five grams of, um, you know, of matter per day, yeah. which is like, you know, you multiply that out, it's carbohydrate, and that's, 20 kilocalories if it's yep. you know fat is 45 kilocalories a day yeah so so just to get an idea of this so my old-fashioned way of thinking is is um is is you know if i wanted to know if if someone was um having low energy availability you know uh, chronically you would just you know sort of weigh them and uh, assuming their hydration status is similar and and you know whatever if they weren't you know i'm just talking about crude yeah um this is obviously a step up from that. How would how would you do it now? So just say if I was thinking, hey, I haven't I haven't started a weight program, I haven't changed my diet or anything. I'm doing my usual cycling. One if I'm you know in deficit or you know surplus, weighing myself. What would you say to do? You know, what's the pros and cons of that? And 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 why would I be doing reds? You know, sort of your new tool that's coming out or whatever. What's what's the rationale there? Yeah, so there's a few pieces there that I'll try to unpack a little bit. Um, and first of all, and we'll get into this a little bit more around the new tool, doing a low energy availability assessment over two or three days of, you know, everyone writing down their energy intake and exercise energy expenditure, it's a snapshot. It's not necessarily reflective of what has happened the last three, six, 12 months. Yes. 
So low energy availability assessment is a picture. It's a snapshot. REDS is a movie. Yes, yes. Because REDS is an accumulation over many, many months. Because if you look at, you know, by the time an athlete has low bone mineral density mm-hmm. and they're under a Z score of one and their stress fractures are going up, that, that's a long-term multi-year dysfunction mm-hmm. and process. So that that's... So in the new tool coming out, um, we actually haven't put in low energy availability assessment at all. All we're using is more chronic indicators of low energy availability and and therefore REDS. Um, Going back to your comment around body weight and why that's tricky Mm -hmm. is when you're in low energy availability, the first thing your body does is it turns down the furnace. Yes. Hazel metabolic rate shuts down. So you preserve Mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. And so you can be in low energy availability, like really low, but you could actually be in energy balance because Mm -hmm. basal metabolic rate is shut off. That's 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 unhealthy. Like when you're when you know, uh, because basal metabolic not shut off is turned down the furnace is maybe three or 400 calories lower per day. And so um, body weight is an incredibly crude estimate of what energy availability might be. Um, Acutely, I think you can see large changes perhaps in in water content and glycogen content. And um, and certainly you can look at trends, but I would never look at just body weight and, and changes in body weight or even body composition and say, oh, this person's in low energy availability because of just how sensitive basal metabolic rate is in, in adjusting um, to what it's, the energy availability is. It's actually is. interesting because I've thought for many years, I used to go out with this marathon runner. She was really serious. She got like a medal in the Commonwealth Games section. And we'd go out and she would literally just eat nothing. We'd go out to an Asian restaurant. She'd get like the rice and then just get like a spoon of the flavor or whatever and put it over it, the plain rice, and then just be eating rice cakes all day. And she was running like 100 and I don't know, I didn't, we talk kilometers eight in Canada and Australia. Yeah, no we're actually yeah, caught but... up. We've actually caught up to, to um, you know, <laughs> not miles, but um, yeah, 160 you know, k's a week, 100 miles a week. Yeah. She never ate anything. Yeah. And I was like, how is she actually doing the exercise, and how is she not just disappearing? You know, and you yeah, say it's probably the low metabolic rate. That's yeah. It, it, I suspect if you brought her into the lab. And you yeah. used any number of predictive equations, Harris Benedict or the Weir equation. This is a whole other mess with resting metabolic rate. And it says, oh, you know, her estimated resting metabolic rate predicted on these equations should be because she's running so much, 3,000 calories a day. But you yeah. go in and measure it, it, it might actually come out at 2,500 because it's it, it's been down regulated. It's it's been oh. it's been slowed oh. down, and that. That comes at a cost. And if you go back to the Ansel Keys, Minnesota starvation studies, like there's some really neat stuff there. Like not only is muscle mass lost and bone health compromised, organs are actually uh, end up smaller. Hair uh, starts not to grow as well. Obviously sex life and libido just goes right out the window. So just and, trying to think about evolutionary wise, is it is it sort of like a situation where, um, you know, your body's it's assuming you're in danger the fact that you're running 100 miles a week you know <laughs> so it's sort of like sucking up energy from other organs and everything to put it into the muscles so you can actually keep doing it i mean so why don't you just why don't why doesn't homeostasis kick in and then just tell you to eat more to match that or are you overcoming that you know with kind of anorexic sort of thinking um yeah so there's there's a few pieces there i think first of all um Although for some individuals, it's really hard to control energy intake and exercise energy expenditure are decisions. It's really hard to tell an athlete to change their basal metabolic rate. Those are outcomes. And so in some ways, that's really neat. Energy availability, are dis- like it's fully in your control. Now, I appreciate in clinical conditions of the eating disorders and anorexia, just like alcoholism or, or other, other diseases, the ability to override the control factors in your brain to eat more yeah. can be impressively, impressively challenging and difficult for individuals to overcome. Um, and generally, the longer you're in a 
overt uh, deleterious eating disorder state, the longer it takes to come out of it and recover from it. Um, and there's been uh, more and more uh, review papers on uh, from anthropology and from evolutionary biology looking at life history and the fact that, um, yeah, like energy is partitioned towards your organs so that you can, and, and the, the most important organs like your brain and your, your heart, um, and, and it's going to come at the expense of muscle and bone. Those are less important organs. And, um, and that partitioning is important. And that's one of the safety net factors is, yeah, when you're in low energy availability, the caloric cost of a pregnancy, that is not a good evolutionary choice when you can barely keep yourself alive. So at ovulation and sex drive and your sex hormones, like it, it's impossible to, uh, to get pregnant in those states. Um, and that's why huh, menstrual cycle status and ovulation are such great indicators for us in female athletes of optimal energy availability. Uh, because if you ovulate, that that is probably the number one yes. indicator we have in females. So is that like one of the, the first things to go sort of thing? So if you're in low energy balance or availability or reds, your body, one of the first things it does is that obviously if you're female, is to say, okay, we stop ovulating, we're not going to make kids because obviously things are tough. So is that so one of the quickest things you can pick up? It, it is. And and so again, as part of this uh, new IOC consensus that'll come out, um, there's going to be a new proposed framework on short-term indicators, medium-term and long-term indicators. Okay. And some of the short-term indicators uh, of low energy availability is low muscle glycogen. You're just not eating enough. That I mean, you, you know this, it, that can happen in 18 to 20 hours if you don't eat enough. Mm -hmm. Iron metabolism can be changed quite quickly. Uh, so hepcidin, nice. the counter-regulatory hormone for bio, iron bioavailability. If you're in low energy availability, it, it, um, it is significantly upregulated within 24 to 48 hours. But yes, in the medium pile, <laughs> the medium indicators, we, we definitely have sex hormones, uh, both for males and females, which, and for males, a, a really early indicator is usually libido and sex drive and mood. And for females, it, as long as you're not on um, birth control, as long as you're not on birth control, uh -huh. your menstrual hey. cycle status is, is, hey, I'm just, I'm just, important. I'm just going to announce like I actually get it now. Yeah. So when I was talking about body weight and everything, so what I was thinking was you were having to do all these fancy measurements of energy intake and energy expenditure and resting metabolic rate and all this stuff. And I'm saying, why don't you just measure measure their body weight? Now I'm getting it. What you're actually saying is instead of doing all those measurements that are really difficult to do, you look at the ovulation of the female, and then that gives you an indication of whether they're, they're in reds or not. You look at the the sex hormones. You look at the libido or whatever. So I'm getting it now. You're saying this yeah. is actually a simpler tool. Rather than trying to do all those really difficult measurements and and whatever, you get an idea, short term, long term, especially long term, of whether they're in an energy deficit situation. You, you got it, Gwen. And our measurement sensitivity just took me half an hour, I think. Yeah, That's it, right. it, yeah. it's tricky, and it our measurement sensitivity of testosterone or thyroid hormones, T three, T four, TSH, or progesterone, estrogen, are, are way better than our ability to actually accurately measure energy intake and exercise energy expenditure. Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense now because, yeah, it's, you're actually looking at the outcomes rather than the inputs. The, input. you know, the inputs are like, you know, what are you eating? How much are you exercising? Are you, you know, the thing you said before about are you riding to the rowing camp or you walking 10,000 steps or whatever? You don't have to actually worry about any of that. You just go, you know, Glenn, go in, measure your sex hormones or, you know, various other things. You're in a low energy deficit. Um, yeah. you're in a low energy balance and then and, and then obviously the outcome will be your performance because you're a performance guy as well your performance won't be as good but then there's all the health things so like you said yeah. the bone mass the and so we we try as best as possible to link um because a lot of athletes aren't necessarily going to care if they have a low thyroxin or thyroid hormones but they do care if i say you're now at risk to have a five times greater risk of stress fractures Yes. And uh, so we published some paper, a paper a few years ago on very elite runners, uh, like 30% of the cohort actually made the 2016 Olympic team. And we we're all up in Flagstaff. And I think we had five countries or six countries involved. 
and uh, males in the lowest quartile of testosterone, so they weren't even clinically low, just the lowest quartile of testosterone, had five and a half times the career stress fractures than the males that were not that were above the lowest quartile. Mm -hmm. Females that were amenorrheic also had about six times the amount of career stress fractures than females that were eumenorrheic. Uh, so amenorrheic is without a menstrual cycle and eumenorrheic means you have a normal menstrual cycle. Um, in, in the women that we could assess that in, because if you're on birth control, we can't make an assessment on amenorrheic and eumenorrheic because it's being forced by the, uh, by the birth control. Just for that question, um, so how do you know, it makes, it makes sense, but how do you know if they amenorrheic, it is due to the, to the reds. Um, is that being shown? Is, is like, for example, if you're a marathon runner, even if you're in balance, um, does that running that much actually cause amenorrhea as well? Or is it just the low energy balance that's the... Yeah. So, so there's, there's a few things there. Every single one of the deleterious body system outcomes, whether it's adverse bones or adverse glycogen or mental health, they all have differential diagnoses that need to be ruled out. Right. Yeah. And there's always something that might be one other reason. So for females, for example, uh, ogliomenorrhea, so that's um, menstrual cycles longer than 35 days. Okay. That could be a cause of REDS or low energy availability, but it might also be PCOS, polycystine ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. So you got to rule out the PCOS because that, 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 that's a clinical condition. So there, there, there's that piece, and this is what makes the diagnosis piece so uh, tricky and complex. You really need to be an expert in multiple organs and multiple body systems to understand how they, how they all, uh, yeah, kind of link together. Um, I actually forget now your first. Oh no, I was just saying, um, is it, I knew that, um, like I knew, I remember Tim Noakes had this paper years and years ago, is um, running as an analog of anorexia. So that right. made me start thinking, is it the running that is doing yeah. a step of running? Can that cause the problems or is it the low energy de deficit or is it combination? Yeah. So again, low energy availability is both energy intake minus the running, the exercise energy expenditure. Yeah. It does appear, and again, going back 25 to 30 years in these well-controlled laboratory studies, that if you result in low energy availability due to exercise, versus low energy availability due to diet right that the more the worse outcome or the more deleterious outcome appears to be dietary restriction oh, wow. exercise and, and that's not completely yes or no but exercise oh. does seem to protect a little bit you know what the deleterious outcomes are low energy it, it, it's, it's mainly dietary driven so that means okay. for anyone and, and honestly, runners only run 12 hours a week. They can eat enough. They can keep up. No runner can run too much because it's only 12 hours a week. Yeah. Maybe when you get to 30 hours a week, you can't actually consume enough calories to handle that volume of training and you get into trouble. But as long as you can eat enough to offset massive training loads, you won't be in low energy availability yeah. and you should adapt okay. Minus, um, you know, stupid training load or, you know, you train too much too fast or all of a sudden you're on the track and spikes and you're not ready for it. Those are training errors. But from an energy perspective, in most situations, if you eat enough, you're going to be okay. Yeah, I really like that, that, that. That reminded me of something else. So when you said if you lose the energy from exercise versus the diet, the diet sort of messes things up. Because... I was just talking to someone about this the other day. This is thing about if you um, go on a low, if you lose a lot of weight through through diet, then you tend to gain it back. You know, the yo-yo thing because your hunger ends up, your hunger hormones are just saying eat, 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 eat until you get back to that normal weight. Yeah. But I was wondering. I, I tend to think it might be different if you lost the weight from the exercise. You you might sort of reset things and whatever. It's just something else, John Hawley and I were talking about that that. Sometimes it seems like if you do something due to diet, oh, that's right. You know, if you're doing exercise, you're maintaining your metabolic rate, for example. If you lose the calories from exercise, you know, if you're losing weight through exercise, you'll, you'll maintain muscle mass, et cetera. 
and you'll keep your basal metabolic rate. But if you lose the same weight through diet, now you turn down your metabolic rate. So, do you know what I'm getting at? I'm saying, yeah. I think yeah, exercise is a better way of doing stuff than diet if it's like, you know. Absolutely agree. And so you, you'll you still turn down your basal metabolic rate through exercise, but less so because you're able to better maintain high quality muscle mass. And if there's any organ we have influence over that is energetically costly, it's muscle mass. Yeah. Your liver is more energetically costly, but it's hard for us to control the quality and size of your liver or your kidneys, but your muscle yeah. mass, you have a lot of control over. And uh -huh. That is, uh, yeah, that's that's 20% 20, 20 plus of your basal, or 40% in some instances, or I'm getting the numbers wrong here. 40% of basal metabolic rate is is your uh, skeletal muscle, right? So yeah. that, that, that's a big chunk. Yep. Hey, one thing again with the ovulation, I, I read uh, Christy Sale, who's going to be coming on the podcast. Sounds like I'm just doing an ad for the podcast, but anyway. Uh, she'll be coming on later. She said something which I wasn't aware of. She said ovulation doesn't occur in every cycle. I should Correct. probably know that. What? Yeah. So, actually, a, a registered dietitian that um, I work with here at the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific, uh, Jessalyn um, uh, O'Donnell, put together a nice infographic for us. And that is because, um, in most instances, if you menstruate, you will ovulate, mm. but not in all instances. And our knowledge in elite athletes, of how many actually bleed every month versus mm -hmm. have a luteinizing hormone surge, an LH surge, which causes ovulation. And so um, we, we don't know. And there's a couple of papers by Mary Jane D'Souza showing in, in your general population, 90% of women who menstruate also ovulate. But in, in her population, I think they had women running 30 kilometers a week, which is, is very low, it's very little. Yes. And in that situation, in her paper, it was like um, uh, only 75% that menstruated actually ovulated. Okay. So we don't know what that actually is in elite athletes running 100K a week or 150 or 30 hour training week for rowing or, or swimming or cycling. And so the, the true gold standard for women to ensure energy availability is to measure ovulation. And you can do that through a urinary assessment by, by urinating on a, on a stick that then detects um, luteinizing hormone. And it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's a way people use um, to, to increase pregnancy rates. And so in, situ in situations where we believe um, someone is menstruating, but they're still having symptoms of REDS, we'll have like send them home with like three months of ovulation sticks Okay. And, and and just say let's check ovulation here because you know what like maybe you're menstruating but you still have these red symptoms and and perhaps you're not ovulating and if you're not ovulating then there's an energy availability issue and we need to increase calories more yeah okay so you said earlier that you know trying to get an athlete to understand you know they need to change things you said if you if you tell them about how many um stress fractures they can get but i'm assuming if you're in red so relative energy efficiency in sport, um, you wouldn't be performing as well, right? So you said about lower glycogen, but I, I'm just assuming um, that they wouldn't perform as well. So that would be a good rationale for them to try and up their intake as well, I would assume. Yeah, and, and I agree with that. And But another thing that will come out in our ISC consensus is a much clearer definition of where red starts and begins. And the fact that a diagnosis of reds can result in varying risk stratification. And so the new clinical assessment tool, uh, uh, which a postdoc of mine is, is doing a massive amount of work on, is going to have a green, yellow, orange, and red light of risk assessment. Okay. And already just at low risk yellow, that's technically a REDS diagnosis, but it's mm -hmm. really low risk. We've only mm -hmm. measured one or two indicators that are off. If you have a REDS traffic light risk assessment, that's really extreme. It usually involves an eating disorder and it potentially could involve removal from sport or, or changing to training and, and really high risk for stress fractures and, and health. 
bradycardia, low heart rate, low blood pressure, a lot of the anorexia literature there. And the tricky piece many times clinically working in the field with athletes is especially in endurance sports that are weight dependent yes. is they might initially drop into a yellow risk score, mm-hmm. improve power to weight ratio. And actually be doing better. And go better. Exactly. And, and then there's this feed forward mechanism like, oh, if I just lose more weight, I'm going to go better yet. All right. So then they, they slip from a yellow risk into orange and then red and then, yeah. Okay. So, so, it's, it's so we say the balance. Yeah. <laughs> so we're saying here that um, I guess this is more leaning towards how I know it's a, a big picture, it's affecting everything, but the reds in, in your mind and how you're wanting to, to be applied is more as a safety thing. Because as you said, you may have an endurance athlete that's actually performing better. In a, in a kind of dangerous reds for their health, you know, for their for their bone, for their reproductive function, whatever. You're saying, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, like the because I was thinking you would you wouldn't perform as well if your glycogen's low and you wouldn't be adapting as well and you might be getting overtrained or whatever. So the athletes going to automatically want to sort of, sort of change that situation. But you're saying they may actually be performing better if they're like an endurance runner or a, or a climber in the Tour de France, but they're putting themselves at risk. Yeah, health yeah. The, the huge caveat being you're performing better, maybe performing better right now. Short term, yes. Because if we look at quantifiable sports, track and field or swimming or cycling velodrome, every world records in senior level athletes, they're not from the juniors. And if you, especially as a teenager, do not treat your body well with uh, energy availability. You get injured. And you don't lay down that last growth spurt of high quality bone. Yes. You will be compromised the rest of your life and you will never get to run as fast as a senior. Okay. You just constantly be getting injured, bone stress fractures, stress reactions. Okay. And I remind athletes of that over and over. All of our records, all of our records in track and field are senior records. And secondly, I remind athletes, do men fa- run faster than women? Yes. Mm-hmm. Who's heavier? Yeah. So body weight on its own would actually, if we compared males to females, would have a negative correlation to performance. Okay. And so okay. We, we, it's about body composition and health long-term. And if I, I can ever find time, I have a long-term 10-year data set in world-class female runners, some of which are a, amenorrheic, lack of menstrual cycle, and some of which are eumenorrheic. And by the time they're 28, 29, and 30, the, the, leanest, the leanest population, the leanest mm-hmm. are the ones that have had their menstrual cycle their whole career. They're Thank the leanest. You because they've treated their body well. Think about males. If you have adequate testosterone versus low testosterone, yeah. and, and I can tell you the performance outcomes are stark and different. Like they're just the 28 year olds who have been healthy their whole career are way outperforming. Maybe yeah. when they were 20, it was different. Though. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I can think of runner, different female runner. She was always so good, but she just had stress fracture after stress fracture after stress fracture, and then she was gone. Yeah. And she was a prodigy. In Australia. So, yeah, you know, when she was younger, she's winning the, we have this big race, the city to surf, you're winning it at 16 years old and things, but just stress factor after stress factor, and then she was gone. So, I guess, I guess putting it together a little bit, with the, we know that people are light. So, in the Tour de France, you know, the lightest people are going up the mountain. I know, sorry, I know I'm just talking about the body weight, there's, there's more to it, there's the body composition, but I, it reminds me of sometimes you hear about an athlete, they might not be that light for a lot of the season, and then they lose the weight just before the Tour de France or during the Tour de France. So it's a short period of low, in, you know, of imbalance. Is that right? And that, that, that might then help them in that event, but then they go back to a more, does that, does that make sense? Is that? Yeah. So, um, so first I would actually say not the lightest person wins the mountain stages in the Tour de France, the person with the highest power to weight ratio. 
because Dominique Pazzavivo is a, he's been in, in a tour cyclist for 15 years and he's about like a meter 60 and he's a good climber, but he, you've probably never heard of him. So he'd be the lightest, okay. but it, and he's good. He's a good journeyman kind of, kind of rider. So it's the power to weight. It's that combination yes. of body composition that is, that is key. And if you're then, too under, under weight or if you're too, um, you know, out of balance, you wouldn't have that power. So you've got to look at the both sides to the, the power to weight ratio. You got it. Because at a certain point, and we, we, we know this from sarcopenia research, we know this from weight loss research, in most weight loss situations without an aggressive exercise component, you lose about 50% of the weight as, as fat and about 50% as muscle. It's, it's, it's about a 50-50. If you have an aggressive exercise component, yes. you, you, it can be more fat and you, you can help retain muscle. Um, but it, yeah, you lose muscle mass, then you're going to lose power. Uh, if you're losing power and pop, you're not going to be a very good 1500 meter runner when it comes to the sprint or the sprint at the end of the tour stage or, or what, what have you. The second part of your question was around, um, how do we best periodize and can, and it, yeah. if we're in a situation that we believe we can get a performance gain and, and this next part of the discussion, I want to put a big disclaimer here. This is. This is not something for teenage athletes and U20s and U23s. This is for um, the elite of the elite athletes that have taken care of every piece of training we can think of. Their nutrition habits are great. They're at, they're, they have good body image. They um, don't have a history of eating disorders or disordered eating. They're well monitored with a professional team. And if at that point there is indications that, huh, you know, if we can periodize body composition through the implement strategic targeted implementation of low energy availability to enhance performance, you know, in a, over a short period of time, then then that is a tool that some of us will work with um, in a, in a safe and collaborative environment that that has medical physicians and, and and people bought into the risk and reward of trying to do that in a in a supportive and safe way. Um, I've seen a, it done really well. I've seen it done really poorly. Um, and, and, and there are ways though, for short periods of time that you can implement that, um, improve power to weight ratio, but it's when you're trying to do that, um, year in and year out. So something like body comp assessment, um, you know, if an athlete peaks in August, I'm as excited in October to do a body composition assessment and see all their numbers come right back up to high values to where they should be for their numbers, for the off season and for health. I'm as excited about that body composition as, as, a, as a body composition uh, pre-competition in the summer. Yeah. Okay, great. So the other thing about um, the downside of REDS is overtraining. I saw you had a paper on um, overtraining syndromes and things like that. So do you want to just flesh that out a little bit? So I'm assuming it increases risk of that and this sort of, um, uh, overlap yeah yeah so that was a classic COVID project where we got a whole bunch of people uh, that I respected around the world to pull together and really work on it on a massive paper that really deals with the diagnosis of overtraining mm -hmm. what that is and isn't versus the diagnosis of REDS and we included a couple of people in the last overtraining syndrome consensus paper. So Romain Mewson is a lead author of the overtraining consensus statement from 2013. He was uh, an author on this complexities of diagnosis for REDS versus overtraining. So a huge confounding factor in the overtraining literature mainly because REDS was only first identified in 2014. So that's fair. We can't, can't blame old overtraining studies on this, is that they do not control well or at all for energy intake or low energy availability in their study design. So they'll come in, they'll split groups. All right, we're going to double the training in this group. Yeah, yeah. Well, did they double the nutrition? Mm -hmm. No. So is that overtraining? Is that an overtraining study or is that actually a red study? That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so through multiple reviews and complexity and talking to the overtraining people and the reds people, 
we have made it really clear in this paper, as clear as we can, if there is an energy deficit and low energy availability or low carbohydrate availability, that is not overtraining. That's a REDS diagnosis. Right. Yeah. If in an overtraining workup, we've, we've examined as much as we can and we're like, no, like that athlete is eating as much as they should be. We don't think there's any nutritional deficiencies. Uh, then that's an overtraining situation. Okay. And so there, there are separate diagnoses that are often confounded. So low energy availability does not lead to overtraining. It leads to REDS. Yeah, I overtraining I does not lead to low energy availability on its own if you can eat enough. Yeah, I, I can definitely imagine. I've, I can think of a whole bunch of papers where they get people in, they try and overtrain them, they they you know double the workload or whatever, and they, that I don't think there's much mentioned about food intake, and it's probably too hard asking as well. Um, Correct, and I I mean. Um, our old papers, they were great and well done at the time. I don't like to over poo poo old papers because we have to put ourselves in the context of the time. Oh, so, yeah, so, yeah, I appreciate. And we put that in our paper, like, hey, this REDS concept and low energy availability at the forefront, low energy availability as a concept has been around 30 years, but it hasn't been at the forefront yeah, until yeah. about 2015. And so all the overtraining studies prior to 2015, they self-identify as overtraining studies. But it, it, in that major review, we, we actually found a whole bunch of them are, are actually technically should be red studies. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's one of those things you don't think of at the time, but then afterwards you go, oh, crap, you didn't think about what they were taking in. And they're just you know, they're increasing the energy expenditure, but not the intake necessarily. Hey, yeah. I've got a question on, I might, thought I might ask you that came up on Twitter. I think you saw it as well. Uh, Sarah Runzo uh, said, could a young female athlete currently have an unusually low heart rate due to a history of underfueling? Does underfueling affect max? So affecting max heart rate and resting heart rate. Uh, is that yeah. something? Yes. Uh, yes, for sure. Um, th this is where you get overlap between overtraining syndrome and red syndrome. And you have to look at other diagnostic criteria to say, no, this is a REDS issue versus an over uh, overtraining issue. Certainly overtraining can cause sympathetic and parasympathetic dysfunction, um, yeah. resulting in lower max heart rate. Um, in many instances of overtraining, initially your resting heart rate goes up five or 10 beats because you, yeah. you're, you're having- And then it goes down. Sympathetic, and then it flips the other way and you're, you're really hooped. Um, but I'll also highlight um, that over the long term, if you look at the anorexia data, um, extremely low bradycardia or extremely low resting heart rates are an indicator as well of, of REDS and extreme eating disorders. So uh, in endurance athletes, that's somewhere on the order of 35 to 40 beats per minute. Like it's it, um, in the anorexia literature, they set it at 60, but we know that that would select about 90% of our endurance athletes as, as exactly. Right. Yeah. So it, in, in the reds literature, it's going to be down around 35 to 40 in athletes. And if you're under that, hmm, you know, and you have other indicators of reds, then we're starting to get a little more concerned. That's interesting. I used to pride myself. I always say I had a resting heart rate of 36 when I was a runner. Huh. Don't tell me it was red. That was just because I was an ox. I had a huge stroke volume. You know, <laughs> you, you, you probably had, uh, yeah, you probably had six liters of blood in there, and, and uh, yeah. yeah. So um, one one thing I, I ask people here and there is is you now it's easy to think you know just Trent's done fantastically. You know, probably everything he does in the lab works and whatever. I think we know that things don't always work. So I I, I kind of throw this out sometimes. Is there situation where you know you've you've had a study or an idea and you've you've you know you put a lot of time into it and it just hasn't worked and you've you know you've had to you know, just sort of challenges that you know real life because you know you get students and they just think everything's going to work and you know nature paper um yeah I'll, I'll give two quick uh examples that are interrelated one's in a lab and one's in real life and um for as crushing as a you know non-statistical outcome in the lab is um Put yourself in the real life when an athlete actually doesn't make an Olympic team. And that's partly on you because you made a mistake. And this is something um, my wife and I have chatted about. But uh, in 2000, and she should be a three-time Olympian. She's a two-time Olympian. Yeah. In 2008, um, 
under my watch as a sports nutrition guy, uh, she became anemic okay. and had low ferritin and, and her hemoglobin dropped. And she won her Olympic trials and ran 406 that year, but the Olympic standard was 405. Okay. And so you'll see uh, a huge part of my career of publications is based purely on my curiosity. I like buried myself in the athlete literature on iron and iron metabolism. And in 2008, honestly, there wasn't that much there. Right. And so since then, you'll see publications on optimizing iron at altitude. And I've teamed up with Pete Peeling out of Australia, who knows way more about iron than I do. And we've done some reviews and it's a real passionate area of mine. So, so there is a mistake okay. uh, for sure. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that happened. And uh, most times there's mistakes when you work with athletes. It comes down to the word assume. Don't make an ass out of you and me. Us and you and me, yeah. The second you say assume or the second assume goes through your head when you work in sport, stop yes. and go and confirm. I assumed my wife was still taking her iron supplement every single day. But because her March blood work looks so good, she's like, uh -huh. I'm going to take mine every other day because I get some GI discomfort. Okay. And, and that was the crux of the problem. So moving forward on that, in a science study, uh, we were looking at hepcidin and trying to, uh, which is an iron pro-inflammatory hormone, which blocks and not blocks, slows iron bioavailability bio um, at three sites, but, but mainly at the intestine and absorptive site, and the anterior sites. And we, we did this awesome project where we're like, oh, these all these micronutrients and cell culture are associated with um, dampening hepcidin's outcomes, and it didn't work. You know, and, and you can see Dylan Dalequest is a master's student. We published the paper. Um, we had high hopes that we were going to have a great intervention here to, to help with uh, uh, inflammation and increased iron, iron bioavailability for athletes. But um, the rationale is all in there. You can look at it at the introduction. But uh, yeah, we, we didn't show anything. So there's a couple of iron examples, one in the real world where an athlete yeah. didn't become an Olympian. Um, I'm still married to her, thankfully. You seem pretty uh, hard on yourself there. You were a bit hard on yourself there, but it was pretty brave for you to use that as an example. It might, might cause a bit of discussion tonight. You know? Well, um, I, I, I take some responsibility. Hillary, it's yeah. some of her responsibility too, but yeah, exactly. yeah we're a team, so huh? that's okay. Oh, good on you. I'm yeah, over I, it now. Things <laughs> Oh, good. Well, Two Olympics are still pretty good, but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I, I often said to students, that my, well, I've said to people here and there that I think 70% of the time I did a study, I would get something different to what I actually thought I'd get. It doesn't mean it, it wasn't it didn't work out well and it might have been more interesting, but you don't always get what you expect. And I think I'm not a very good researcher. 70% of the time, I get something different to what I expect. So I guess, you know, partly for students watching or whatever, you know, and you also got to keep an open mind, as you said, don't assume. But you've also got to keep an open mind, right? You might get a finding different to what you thought, but actually might end up more interesting. You, you go off in a whole new new field, you know? So. Totally agree. And I'm disciplined from Lawrence Spree to have try to make hypothesis statements as best as you can. Get your results. Go back to those original hypothesis statements and really think about them. Um, and I'd encourage us all, whenever possible, to try to publish those non-findings because Absolutely. I think our... Our entire field is, in many instances, uh, yeah, undermined by non-findings because not everyone well, publishes so -called, them. You know, the so-called so negative findings. I mean, if you've done the study in a, in a, in a, in a, in a thorough way, that is a finding. And, and it actually means that someone else won't go and think, oh, I wonder if this will happen. You've already found, oh, no, it didn't. I think neg I, I hate that term, negative finding. I think it's yeah. really important sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I 100% agree. And I, you know, I, I didn't say, I, I, I hate the term negative finding too. I said non-finding, but it is a finding. I should find another way to describe that more positive. Yeah, non-finding. Yeah, because it's a finding. It's just not what you were expecting or not what's yeah. going to maybe help you get the grant or whatever. But yeah. it's still important because you know that answer, right? And just yeah. another Twitter, I try, because I ask people if they got, so Paul Marino asked, now, is there any difference in terms of body comp well-being when varying the timing of ingestion for endurance athletes, ingesting most carbs and cal and kilocals in and around the training versus ingesting the same amount of kilocalories with other timings. I'm not sure if this is specific. To yeah, something. I, 
I, I think I can get that a little bit. So he had two qualifiers in there, though, body composition or well-being. Yeah, you're right. Yep. And so there's different answers, I think, for, for those. One, yes, we do know one of the best ways to prevent or address low energy availability is to focus on carbohydrate calories in and around training before, during, and after. Yep. That That as an intervention is definitely the way the field is moving. And we know that carbohydrate availability on its own, even without no low energy, causes um, negative effects to bone markers. Okay. And carbohydrate is a key player in this low energy availability field. And so, yes, for well-being, I would, I would say yes, like trying to get your carbohydrate in and around before, during, and after training is, is, a, good is, is a good recommendation. To change or optimize body composition, I am pretty sure there's no data out there to support that yes or no. And it would be an incredibly, incredibly, almost impossible study to design because of the number of... Um, the number of influencers of body composition beyond just timing of carbohydrate around. Exactly. I, I, well, I don't think we'll ever answer that. I'm very pleased that you uh, focus on carbohydrate there. There's so much, again, on Twitter. It's just it's just keto this and keto that. <laughs> it's surely carbohydrate is, you know, that was my PhD. Yeah, carbohydrate availability before, during, after exercise. Hello. Um, all right. So just, just before we finish up, we've covered a lot of uh, good stuff here. What are you excited about at the moment? What what other stuff are you working on? Um, actually, you mentioned the altitude, and uh, that has a bit of a an overlap with the energy intake as well. But what are you excited about at the moment? Yeah, so in in the past few years, I've had a real again follow my areas of of passion. Um, when my wife got pregnant, uh, there was no information in the literature on how to train in elite athletes. So we've just published a paper passion project. It took about seven years with um, nearly 50 elite female runners. Um, we have a, another ah, paper yes. and some other work in that space coming along. Um, I've, uh, with pregnancy, uh, I've yeah. done, pardon with me, yeah, pregnancy and elite, yeah, yeah. And elite mm -hmm. females. Yeah. Um, yep. And, and outcomes and injury risks and birth outcomes and, and obviously mother outcomes. Uh, so that's in the works. Uh, and then, and then a, I was lucky to be able to drive as a principal investigator um, and get a great postdoc in, in Dr. Ida Haikura, who was trained by Louis Burke and John Hawley. She mm -hmm. came to Canada and we're doing a pan-Canadian um, REDS cross-sectional study um, that also has an intervention arm. And uh, we've, we were approaching over 200 world-class elite athletes that have had blood work, DEXA scans, resting metabolic rate, exercise tests, extensive questionnaires. Um, and, and so in the coming years, or I, I think there'll be maybe four or five, I think really great papers that come out of, of that big data set, both males and females, endurance sport, team sport. Um, so I'm excited about, about that work. Awesome. As well. If I yeah. could just flesh out a little bit, I was interested, you said something in, on Twitter, 46% of women perform better after having a child, is that right? Yeah, so in that cohort, um, women were split into two groups. They're asked in a questionnaire if they intended to come back to elite or previous performance versus those that did not. And the women with intent to come back, there was no statistical decline in performance pre and post pregnancy in the two year period pre and the two year period post. And just straight up, about half of them actually perform better. And because we use track and field, we could use existing hard quantitative data, um, performance data from races, convert it to IAAF points. Uh, okay. The IAAF points is a um, generalizable factor. So you compare uh, like a men's 100 meter sprinter to a woman's hammer yes. floor. Yep. And, and we could actually do the full, and all that data is in the public domain. So we could just scrape all that data, do the analysis and, and do, do some modeling. And the women that did not intend to come back to performance, they were about significantly worse, about four and a half percent decline in performance. And so um, we hope, or I hope, that just gives more and more evidence and that, that women can come back just as strong, if not stronger, 
um, sports and shoe companies and um, sponsorship companies got to realize this and understand this. Don't be dropping women when they get pregnant. Um, so I, I, I hope that that is a positive message that, that gets out there. I wonder if part of it is, you know, after you have kids, you're kind of slightly busier. I wonder if they train harder, like more efficient, you know, like uh, I wonder if there's any interaction there that they have less time so they sort of train harder with what time they have. One of the papers we're working on is uh, we asked a whole bunch of questions around uh, as well around social, economic and um, family support structures. And that that's a big piece for sure in success. Um, and then a lot of women also say, oh, you know, the last 10K of a marathon, um, you know, you, you used to think it's painful and, and, until you've had oh. a baby. No, it just re it recalibrates your your pain yeah. threshold a little bit. Yeah. You know what's the funny thing with that is you know we've done a lot of muscle biopsy studies, and we'd find that the 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 people that complain the most about them are actually sometimes the athletes and you know they're a bit precious or whatever. But then the ones that complain the least are the middle aged women. So we've did some studies with type two diabetes and control people with type two diabetes and controls. They say, oh, that's nothing compared to childbirth. <laughs> so, yeah. Totally. It's yeah, the exactly. it, it's the young male blokes that are the the worst. Exactly. Like we were in Lupin's Loon's lab, or when I was doing a postdoc, they're doing a lot of elderly sarcopenia research in in the in 60, 70, 80 year old Dutch that have literally survived a world war. Wow. They mm -hmm. were like, this is nothing. It was like <laughs> they were yeah. the easiest going, most yeah. pleasant um uh subjects or participants you could ever imagine well you know another funny story of that i was just talking to derek clayton do you know the name derek oh clayton? yeah 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 yeah. Deep, so yeah. He, yeah he ran the world record or the world best for the marathon in, in 1969 you know yeah. 2833 yeah. anyway he was tested by david costa i did my master's with in the u.s and at, at that time and he had a paper like you know um physiology of a world championship marathon you know, in equals one anyway at that time, anyway, and then we did a follow-up. So in 1990, I was doing my PhD. And David Costal came over and he did this follow-up with all these master's athletes. And he tested Derek Clayton. And I was actually in charge of the Douglas bags. It was stressful if I screwed, screwed that up. And um, anyway, we biopsied it. And, and he went, F, F, F. And I was like, shit, you're okay? Did it hurt? He goes, no, he was pissed off. He didn't have one in 1969 because David wanted to biopsy in 1969 and he didn't do it. He's like, there's nothing. And he was really pissed off that he didn't have the, have the biopsy back then. To, you know, to yeah. Get it. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. I oh, didn't I, know you worked with David Costa. We could do a whole podcast on, uh, on his hey, contributions tell me about to it. our field. And yeah. What, well, what an amazing, amazing actually, man. I've been trying to get him. I've asked him like three times or something. I'm trying to get him on. I don't know if he's too modest or something, but that wasn't really something I could remember him being. But um, he doesn't want to. He's not responding to coming on, even though he actually co-authored one of the chapters, The History of um, Exercise Metabolism with Andy yeah. Hogan. So another all-state person. Yep. Yeah. Tell, yeah. Him, uh, tell him it's a podcast on swimming. Maybe he'll come on there. That's true. That's true. He's amazing. Yeah. All right. So it looks like we could talk about all sorts of things, but I know you're a busy man. So thank you very much for um, coming on. It's been great. Back, all right. And I'll catch up with you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank See you. Ya. Thanks everyone for listening. Bye. Okay. Bye.